Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we sit down with local elected leaders from all across Canada. Now, over the course of this episode, we will learn about who our guest is, what drives them, and how they are working to make their community a better place for everyone who lives there. Now, today, we are honored to welcome to the show from the town of Mayor Thorpe, Alberta, Mayor Janet J. Bush. Janet, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris, and thanks for having me. Thank you so much for participating. And I, I want to start with the big question. And this is the question I start most of my interviews off. So you're no exception. Where did your sense of duty to serve come from? Oh, my gosh, that's a really good question. Wow. Um, and to, to call it, to state it so formally, a duty to serve. Really good question. Um, I became a parent at a really young age. And once you start to look at life and the world through the lens of a parent, um, your appreciation for everything that goes on changes to some degree. And I think as your kids get older, it changes even more. I got involved when my kids started school, I got involved in parent councils. At one time, I had one kid each in three different schools and I sat on every one of the parent councils. So it, it, it got busy. Thankfully, I had a husband who was working in the good old oil and gas sector, making a good living. So I didn't have to have a job, but um, that kept me really busy. And, and through that, I learned that I have an affinity and uh, maybe a bit of a passion, if you want to call it that, for governance just in general. And I know that that makes me weird. Um, policy I love weird. Hey, well, hey, okay, then you and I are going to get along great. Um, policy wonks are kind of an odd bunch. Um, and, you know, and, that, and that's part of it. Uh, when I moved to the town of Marathorpe, let me back that up just a smidge. I was born in northeastern BC on what my mother not so lovingly referred to as a stump ranch um, in the early 1960s, which uh, translated to more common vernacular would be a homestead. Uh, yes, in the early 60s, they were still homesteading in northeastern BC. Um, but when we moved to Edmonton, I was still pretty, pretty little. I wasn't even quite five when we moved to the city. But from the minute I have um, an appreciation, let's call it that, or in my case, lack thereof, for my surroundings, because we moved to Edmonton, I'm not a city dweller. I don't, I don't like the city. I have more colorful terminology I typically use to describe the city, but we'll leave that alone. Um, so when we moved, when I got, um, got married, got uh, involved with my husband, and we got married and all of those things, we moved to smaller communities. And we all, and we've really enjoyed that. We came to uh, Mayor Thorpe a number of years ago, good grief, 16 years ago, I want to say. Um, I decided that it was just about the right size little town. It's about 1,300 people, uh, a little over 1,300 people now, just about the right size town. Um, and I got involved here too, more with governance stuff. I, I got involved in the uh, the local co-ops board of directors, which I chaired for a couple of years. And, and you know, that's just kind of always been where my, my brain has been at. I'm, I guess, a leader at heart. Most of my career has been spent in management positions. Um, that's kind terminology for I'm a control freak, I think. Um, I, I'm not going to say it. You can say it. I'm just going <laughs> to not and agree with you, Janet. Yes. Well, if yeah. you believe you are a control freak, yes, you are. <laughs> well, you know what? And and uh, I'll own that. that. That's cool. I'll own that. <laughs> I'm okay with that. Um, when I got involved in council leader in Mayor Thorpe, I had met the former mayor, a formidable lady by the name of Kate Patrick. Um I met her, I can't even remember how I met Kate, but I met her through another avenue. And and when the election for 2017 was, you know, looming, so earlier in the summer, she poked me in the ribs one day when we were somewhere and said, you should run for council. And I went, and just kind of, you know, set it aside. I didn't really think about it. And then the next time I saw her, she did the same thing. Well, you should run for council. And I said, Kate, I don't know if I'm there. I don't know if that's where my brain's at. And then the next time I saw her, she said, we need to have coffee because I want to talk to you. And I thought, okay, now this is where she's going to pull the big guns out here. She's going to beat me over the head with, 
you know, that whole sense of duty idea and all, she's going to beat me over the head with all of that. So I met Kate and had coffee with her. And um, by the time I, I went there, determined in my mind, I wasn't going to set myself up for this. I'm not getting, I'm not doing it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I left there and I had walked where um, we had coffee because Mayor Thorpe is the dreaded 15 minute city. You can walk from one end of my town to the other in 15 minutes and everything you could possibly want is located within that radius. So you I live. don't want people to want, listen to my show anymore, do you? <laughs> You're like hitting all the keywords that people just don't like these days. You know, the reality of it, when I started researching that whole 15 minute city thing and the whole tinfoil hat craziness that was going on about it, I thought, what are these people so off the rails about? I live in a 15 minute city. Mayor Thorpe is literally that. So anyways, I walked down and I met Kate. And when I was walking home, I muttered to myself, the entire way from the restaurant home going, oh my God, I'm going to do this. I can't believe, what am I, you know, and try to talk myself out of it. But in the end, I didn't. Ran for council in 2017 successfully. Um, and by January of 2019, Kate Patrick decided she was going to retire. And sitting in the room um, were a group of people, very dedicated people, community servants, just, just like the one you're talking to now. Um, but none of the, they either didn't feel quite qualified for the job or they didn't want, the plain and simple didn't want the job. And I went, oh, geez. <laughs> so I ran for mayor successfully. And then in- uh, the In election, a by-election or in a general? Uh, no by-election. So I actually okay. had to find my council seat, which is scary because if you're not the successful candidate, you don't have a seat on council anymore either because you you have to resign your council seat in order to run for a different position. Um, so I was elected the mayor that we had uh, three by-elections in that four-year term in my tiny town, which is unheard of. That's kind of weird. Wow. Um, but we had one councillor bought a property in the county and so he couldn't sit anymore. And then Kate resigned and then, you know, all the things. So anyways, um, I ran again in 2021 successfully. Nobody challenged me for the mayor's seat. And that's kind of where I sit today. Um, my so sense of priority in, in establishing that as kind of where I am in life right now comes from the fact that I have kids. I have three of them. One lives in Stony Plain. Two of them live here in this town with four of my eight grandchildren. Oh, wow. My job as a grandparent and as a parent is to do my best to make the world a better place for the for the legacy that I'm hoping to leave behind. And that's my children and my grandchildren. That's why I got involved locally. It's why I ran provincially, because it's it's literally my job. If you want to call it a mandate, call it a mandate. It's my mandate as a grandma. So for those who are listening to this outside of Alberta, uh, Alberta just went through a recent provincial election where Janet did put her name on the ballot for the Alberta party. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that for anyone who's listening to that. So they're wondering, what party did you run for? I want to yeah. go back to your grow, your a time in Northeast BC and in Edmonton before you got to Mayor Thorpe. Was politics something that was even an interest of yours? Like, did you get involved in local campaigns municipally, provincially, federally, or did it literally come during that 2017 election when you went, okay, I guess I'm going to do this and let's see how a, a, a campaign is run municipally or even just a campaign is run? Um, The fever, if you want to call it that, um, to be actually involved came in 2017. I've always had an interest in politics. I don't come from a particularly political household. Um, so it wasn't discussed at the dinner table? No, nah, mom never talked about it much. My dad never talked about it much. Siblings, you know, I have, I have a brother who lives in Saskatoon. He was a police officer on the Saskatoon City Police Force for almost 30 years. Um, he got involved in municipal politics and was elected as the mayor of Saskatoon for a term. 
he ran for council first and then he got elected as the mayor for a term um and you know so it, it, always a little bit interesting from that standpoint but again i think it i think it really comes back to my to my history in management and my admitted tendency toward being a control freak i like i i want to know what's going on and if i can have a thumb in the pie then you know what I, i'm i'm better positioned to to be able to know what's going on and to maybe in some small way alter the trajectory of things that that are not that don't sit right with me now during that 2017 campaign while it took you a few times to actually put your name on the ballot it took Kate asking you not once, not twice, probably about not 19 times, but 20 times or whatever, however many times. Um, you you seem to have had a an active role in the community. You were on the board of the local co-op. You were uh, volunteering for local PTAs. You were, uh, I'm assuming, doing other things as well. When you were out talking to residents and traditionally you would go out door knocking and go to approach people at community events and say, hi, I'm Janet. I'm running to be your next counselor for the town. What issues do you remember hearing about? Were they the issues that you thought you would be hearing about or were they the issues that were more micro to or more uh, individuals would have like i i need my street plowed more often i want a park in my area upgraded what, or were they the the town needs to grow more the town needs to move forward the property taxes need to be low do you remember if they were more macro or micro issues you know typically when you're talking to the to the average individual in the aisle of the co-op or whatever it's they're more micro issues um the macro stuff the macro stuff I think you develop an appreciation for after you've heard about a number of the micro issues. So some of the, I mean, you hit on, you hit on a lot of them. People want to talk about how their roads get plowed. They want to talk about the fact that the park's not maintained and they want to talk about a whole bunch of other things. Surprisingly enough, for people that have been residents of the town for quite some time and or Albertans for some time or their entire lives, there's a surprising number of people that don't understand where the separation is. Like they want to talk to you about um, something to do with the school or they want to talk to you about something to do with a hospital. Well, okay, not my jurisdiction though. Like well, I have no control over that, right? Like it, it's, it's always surprised me the number of people that don't understand that separation of, of levels of power. So I'm going to challenge you on that for a second here, uh, Janet, because while they may not, while you may say they may not understand, I think it's they don't care. I don't think they care about if it's a provincial or federal or municipal issue. They've elected you to represent them on those provincial and federal issues. So as their mayor, as their counselor, how do you balance that you you know it's a provincial issue. You know it's a federal issue, but they've come to you because you are the local representative and you are the closest to them. And you know what? I, I, I've i always appreciated that terminology that local elected officials, municipal elected officials are the, are the politicians, and I hate that word. <laughs> <laughs> but you are one. <laughs> I know. We're the, we're the closest level of government to the people we are literally the boots on the ground so i and i appreciate your viewpoint and you're not incorrect in that um you're right they don't care if they want to talk about a school i will have that conversation and i will provide them with um contact information for our mla and for the minister of education and i will also say that you know what the next time i'm having a conversation with the mla i'll bring that up I'll have a conversation with him. Luckily, I have a reasonably good relationship with both the MLA and the MP in this area. So uh, I have cell phone numbers for both of them. If I've got something that I need to talk to them about, I just pop them a text or whatever. And and we agree to get together the next time in, they're in the area or we make a date for coffee or whatever. Um, but you're right. People want to know that there's somebody willing to listen to their concerns, provincial, federal or otherwise. And they want to know that that their voice is being heard and that the message will be carried. 
you you talk about the issues you talk about the federal provincial issues municipally though and i i'm not bursting any bubbles here because i've literally chatted with two other people on the day this was recorded and we talked about this issue uh very uh, prominently municipalities don't have a lot of money they're struggling right now and you can't run deficits you have to run balanced budgets every year if you don't get grants you can't do some projects if you don't get uh certain fundings you can't do certain things you but we are seeing more municipalities being downloaded with more federal and provincial responsibilities rcp RM, rcmp retroactive pay being one i'm not sure if that would affect uh marathor because you are under that 5000 uh, uh population limit but how do you see your role as mayor and council as a whole of ensuring that what goes on in city hall affects everyone benefits everyone while realizing that outside forces are basically telling you well you can plan for the future but you're going to have to spend all your money now and you won't be able to save for it that's pro that's probably the toughest balancing act <laughs> as a elected official um and really what it what it comes down to when you're a new counselor um you've heard the terminology drinking from a fire hose there is no better example than than being a first term counselor um and part of that drinking from a fire hose is trying to formulate some sort of an understanding of municipal finance which is a completely different animal than anything else you, you you would likely have ever encountered in life. And I mean, I've been in management, so like I know what budgets look like and I do, you know, I've been involved in all of those things, but municipal finance is a completely different animal. Um, the biggest document a municipal council does in a given year is the budget. It is literally the biggest bylaw you will pass each and every single year is your budget. We are required under the MGA to have uh, a certain number of budgets in advance, like we have a, a cycle we have to plan for. So lots of times we're we're kind of bumping our way down the cycle, but every four years you've got a new bunch of people sitting at the table and you got to go through the whole thing from the ground up again. Um, that's not to say that you throw up what you what's been going on already, but it it bumps its way down the road one year after another and you have to approve it every single year. So um, changes to municipal funding, um, recently, the most recent iteration of provincial funding for municipalities has been the municipal sustainability, municipal sustainability initiative, AKA MSI. And they have been working on a new formula, a new model for years, almost since I started on council they've been, at least for the last three years, they've been working on the local government fiscal framework or LGFF, as we like to call it. I am so impressed that A, I know what you're talking about and B, I completely understand what you're talking about. I'm going, oh my God, I've done too many of these interviews where I know all these acronyms now. Is, isn't it, isn't it bizarre what your, what your education will bring, will bring to your, to your understanding? Um, but the municipal finance in and of itself is such a complex thing. By the time we get a budget, our chief financial officer has been through all of it and she's bringing us what looks like it will work for the upcoming year. Council's always got questions every now and then we send them back and tell them to sharpen their pencils and, and do other things. But, We've got a really well-oiled machine here in town and the lady that's our chief financial officer has been in that position for over 10 years. So she knows the finances of this little town inside out backwards and upside down. Um, every time we get a new something, since I've been, <laughs> let me back up a second. Since I've been a municipal councillor, we've seen grants in place of taxes disappear in the province of Alberta which means that um, provincial facilities in my town don't pay property taxes. We used to get a decent amount of money as a grant to replace that. We don't get that. It was reduced by 50% and then it was reduced again. And 
yeah. Anyways, and now we've got the police, the police costs. We've got that that's been that's been shunted on to us by the by the province. And ours has gone from twenty some odd thousand dollars to forty six thousand dollars. And in a very short period of time, it'll be up over sixty. Yeah, exactly. Right. And um, the, we have to try to absorb all of that because we're, we can't put a levy on our taxes. We can't add a little bit extra to our tax. They've told us we're not allowed to do that. You can't even, you're, we're not even supposed to show it as a line item on the tax notice. Now, some municipalities are still doing that so that people can understand how much of their tax bill is actually being shunted off to the province for policing. Um, in our case, we have the reverse side of our tax notice. It's got a bunch of information that breaks down all of the amounts on the tax notice. So the downloading doesn't stop. And you mentioned a big one that's coming that's coming out a lot of municipalities in this province, and that's the RCMP back pay. Like you said, in the town of Marathon, because we are a community under five thousand, we're likely not gonna we're likely not gonna get hit with that. But we all, you also have to remember that the current police funding formula, PFM police funding model, current PFM will end soon. Yeah. And they're going to think of another, like there'll be another one after that. And we have no way of knowing how that's going to impact us on a, on a budgetary scale, just like we have no idea what LGFF is going to look like. We already know the pot's smaller. The pot of money is smaller. We already know that. So good bet we're going to get less. And that means that's going to leave really talented administrative professionals in this town to try to figure out how you navigate that without sending taxes through the roof and without cutting services. Administration plays one part in this role because you, at the end of the day, have to vote on it because administration will put put the budget to you, say, here's what we believe is the most uh, issues. And then I've been in the other side of the, uh, the, the, not the table, but in the other side of the room. And I've seen councils go line by line, go, nope, nope, yep, nope, nope, yep. And then there's the always the input from councilors as well what you've heard from residents because administration plays one role council has to take what they've heard from residents and play another role. How do you balance that aspect of the job? Because you I'm assuming have gotten quite well at saying the word no to people saying, Hey, can I get a new park or can I get, can we get a, uh, a swimming pool in our, uh, our town? Can I get a new, can we get a new library? And you will have to say, Unfortunately, it's uh, it's not fiscally feasible to do that right now. So no, it's not in our agenda. Is it is it hard to say no to people when they come to you with ideas of how they want to see the town improved? Um, sometimes. <laughs> Other times, it's like, what are you talking about? No, of course not. No. Um. Typically, the the response is more nuanced. Um, I've never thought of myself as a um, particularly dip, dip, diplomatic individual. I tend more often to speak my mind. Um, I've gotten a little more, yeah. Right? I would never I've, have guessed that, Janet. <laughs> exactly. I've gotten a little more circumspect, maybe is the word, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, often you have to offer a more nuanced response, you know, great idea. And um I'm sure there'd be wide support for it in the community. That said, here are the nuts and bolts of that equation. And hopefully if I'm good enough at explaining, which I've gotten way better at over the years, if I'm good enough at explaining those nuts and bolts and how it, how it weighs out um, fiscally in the end, by the time the conversation's over, they may not like my answer, but at least they understand it. And I think my job as an elected official and maybe more so as the chief elected official is to put myself in a position where when people have those hard questions, they're coming to me and I'm able to provide enough information, intelligent information for them to actually 
understand the issue. Again, they may not like my answer. They may disagree with my answer, but they at least understand why the decision was made the way it, the way it was or why we have to go the direction that we've chosen to go. We, we have seen, and I, we talk about being civil and we talk about being cordial with people and telling them the truth about the issues that are going on and why you can or can't do something. You've been in politics now for, since 2017. And I hate mm-hmm. to ask this question, but sometimes there are uncivil people. Sometimes yeah. there are people who want to voice their concerns and want you to stand there and take it and hear mm-hmm. their why why you are a bad person or why you are doing what you're doing and is hurting them. Particularly, especially when you raise taxes. I can imagine the emails that you get, even if you raise taxes one, two percent. How do you deal with that? How do you personally deal with the negative aspect of the job? Because I can imagine anyone, it gets to you. Um, I sold real estate <laughs> space of time. And as a realtor, I think I, I developed a bit, um, a bit of a tougher skin maybe. Um, but I one you kind of have to as a realtor because you're going to get you're going to get called out a lot as a realtor people you know you give somebody a property evaluation say what are you talking about it's going to be worth another fifty thousand dollars well emotionally to you it's worth another 50 grand but on the market right um so i got i think i got um i don't want to say accustomed to but i was better able to handle um that um maybe negative projection politics is different because people true community members i don't want to just say people in general because there are people that live in towns and all it is is a place to live the the future of the town the uh, general well-being of they don't care because all they do is come home and sleep they barbecue a steak and then they go to work the next day right it's you know there are people in towns that are like that. And then there are people in towns that actually make a home there. They make a, they surround themselves, they cocoon themselves in a little town. This is, this is where they come when they need to feel connected, when they need to feel safe, when they, when they come home, they don't just go to their house, they go to their town. Like, honestly, Chris, when I drive down, the, if I've been gone for a while, like I got back from Saskatoon a few days ago, I was visiting my brother. Um, and as I approach my town, we've got a big sign near the, near the, at the edge of town um, along Highway 43. And I saw the town, I saw the sign with our, our logo and Mayor Thorpe on it. And I went home, not my house, my town is my home. This is where I have invested my heart and my soul. And I've got family here and we've put down roots here and and this is our place so for people that are as invested in my town as am i i owe them as much time as they want to sit and talk to me and as much complaining as they want to bend my ear with i owe them my ear to let them do that and once they're done that I will sit there and respect, I will talk to anybody. My phone number is literally, pub- my cell phone number is literally published on the website. Again, every, we just every, had this conversation with another counselor. Local <laughs> counselors just love giving out their cell phones for some reason. So, you know, and it's on my business cards. But the, the funny thing is, I will tell everybody, if you want to talk to me, that's my cell phone number. Pop me a text, tell me who you are. And I will meet you for coffee any day of the week. I live across the back alley from the best coffee place in town. So I'll meet you. I'll meet you for coffee anytime. And I will listen to anything that you want to tell me. And I, and I warn them, I may not agree with where you're coming from. We may not reach a consensus during the conversation, but I'm willing to sit there and listen to what you have to say. Dealing with the negativity is part and parcel of it. I have gotten um pats on the back from a number of my counselors because mayors of the past have not been willing to get into the weeds on social media 
And I don't do it all the time, but on specific issues, if I feel like it's, if there's a bunch of misinformation floating around on social media or it's getting a little bit out of control, I will put myself into that conversation and try to bring the accurate information to the conversation so that at least people can have an intelligent conversation and they're not speculating and they're not listening to some rant from somebody who probably doesn't even live in town. Realistically, lots of the activity on social media, but my little town comes from out in the county. It doesn't even come from people who live in my town. But they consider, that's that's the fascinating thing about living rural, right? Mayor Thorpe proper is its own municipality. But if you talk to anybody within a 30 mile radius of my town, 40 mile radius of my town, if you talk to them on the street and ask them where they're from, you know what they say? Marathorpe, you bet, you bet. I, and it, I, it, part of my job is to listen to them. The other part of my job is to not let my administration take crap from people. So if people get on social media or want to, you know, want to badmouth my my administration, I will put myself in. I will put myself in between um, that disgruntled citizen and my administration every day of the week and twice on Sunday. And I will do likewise for my council because I believe that it's my job. I'm the chief elected official. It's my job to stand in the breach and stop the flow of crap from getting to the people that don't necessarily deserve it. How do you see the role of communication playing in your role as mayor and chief elector elected officer of your community? Because you talk about the misinformation, you talk about the attacks from either administration or council, but I can imagine you can't defend everyone 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can't dispel misinformation because as much as you're on Facebook, there's probably a secret group on top of the secret group. That's a, the secret secret group that like five people have another secret group. And you can't stop that spread. So how do you communicate in a in a day where people have their different facts, different alternative versions of how things go, and the mis the, the the lies that get spread quicker than the truths? Boy, alternative facts. Whoever thought that would be common <laughs> vernacular? What the heck is an alternative fact? A lie. <laughs> Is the grass not simply green in the you know? Um, some of it's white, some of it's brown because it's burnt. <laughs> so see? see, um, um, from my perspective, it's it's always about bringing the facts to the conversation. And you're right, there are people out there. You can tell them facts six ways from Sunday. You can show them all the data, show them all the statistics, and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna tell you you're full of BS, right? Uh, um, Mayor, but, <laughs> I, right? Um, but when I talk to people, uh, and and I'm trying to bring them that information, that factual information, as long as I know that what I'm saying is the act, that's the facts, that's that's how it is. Uh, I have to be comfortable knowing that I'm delivering the right information. Um, whether they choose to accept and believe it or not, I have no control over that. You know, I really don't. And you're right. I can't, I can't unequivocally uh, defend every single action of my administration. And I can't unequivocally defend every single action of my entire council. Sometimes people screw up. Um, but a politician admitting that people screw up. Oh, hey, I'm the first. I own any any um, um, unsavory matter that I might disturb. <laughs> I own it because for me, that's part of it. That's part of integrity is owning your crap, positive, negative, or indifferent. Part of 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 functioning of conducting myself with integrity and with principles is owning my crap. Yeah, you know. Um, I want to turn to one last sort of big question. Sure. 
municipalities are going through a bit of a change and they're like, we've talked about the downloading, but I want to go a little bit more in depth here. Where do you see the town of Marathorpe in 10 years? Where do you see the town in 15 years? Like, do you still see it as a thriving place? Do you still see people wanting to come to your community? It's going to go parcel and part into what we're going to be talking about a little bit later around tourism and the community as a whole. But for you, do you see Marathorpe on a good footing right now that in 10 years you can say, okay, even if I left after one term, one full term in office, I've set the town up for success 10 years from now? Um, I see Marathorpe as a thriving agricultural hub in rural Alberta, because that's literally what it is. That's its claim to fame. We are on the on the northwest end of Lac Saint Anne, we have a vast agricultural base around our town, but our town is also supported um, via the oil and gas industry because there's a lot of people that live in Bayerport but work in Whiteport. Um, and from a 2016 study, the town of Bayerport ranked number one as the number one community in the entire province impacted by forest, by the forestry industry. That 2016 study showed that 27% of household income in my town was derived from the forestry industry because there's mills in Whiteport. We have the Blue Ridge Mill just up the road from us. Um, so I, Mayor, Thorpe, Mayor Thorpe will continue to thrive. Mayor Thorpe has long been the little engine that could in times when everybody thought the town should, you know, just kind of fold up the tents and, and go away. It never has. We've just continued to soldier on. Um, our infrastructure is in great shape thanks to a very dedicated long-term CAO not the one we currently have, our, our former CAO retired last fall, but she'd been here for 15 years. Oh, and wow. she left the town in way better shape than she found it. Our infrastructure is all in good shape. We've got, arguably, Chris, we've got facilities in our town that we don't have any right to have. Our town is less than 1,400 people. We've got an acute care hospital in our town. We've got a medical clinic that's for one, for the first time in a really long time, not short of doctors. Um, we have a food store, we have an auto repair shop, we've got two drug stores, we've got accountants, we've got, I mean, we've got restaurants, we've got a Tim Hortons. I was going to say, now. you have a Tim, wow. I was going to say, a Tim Hortons. If, you, if it's not small town Alberta, unless there's at least two pizza stores in town too. So you've got. Uh, we do. We have Pizza Napoli and people come from Whiteport to get pizza at our little Pizza Napoli here in town. And uh, the Burger Baron makes pizza and you can buy pizzas, in-store made pizzas at the co-op. And yeah, and we've got. We've got an outdoor swimming pool, and I've all, I've already told my my council that when I win the lottery, one of the first things I'm going to do is is make our pool indoor so that it can be used year round. But we have an outdoor swimming pool, junior Olympic sized outdoor swimming pool. We have um, our arena is uh, NHL grade facility, ice surface, the whole nine yards. It's beautiful. Um, we have sports grounds. We've got an elementary school. We've got a junior, senior, like everything you need is in my little 15 minute town. <laughs> um, so in, in the grand scheme of things, we've got more and, a, and an RCMP detachment also lives in my town. Mm -hmm. um, we've got more things in my little town than some towns twice the size of this one have. So we're pretty well positioned to weather just about anything because it's all here you yeah. don't have to go any you've got a field store if you needed a pair of socks you go to the field store and get a pair of socks you know you know it's all it's all here chris um mayor mayor thorpe will continue to soldier on because that's what it's always done it's always had dedicated counselors we've got great staff at our town office um and it'll just continue to do the things it's always done. Will it face challenges? Of course it will, sure. Um, but we've got a, a light industrial commercial subdivision south of the highway that 
cross my fingers, where we'll see some activity on um, this year or, or next year. Uh, we've got lo lots ready for development in town for new housing. Um, yeah, it's all here, Chris. Everything you could possibly want is here. And we're 135 kilometers from Edmonton on the second busiest highway in the entire province of Alberta. The only highway busier than this one is the highway between Edmonton and Calgary. Even Highway 63 north of Fort McMurray isn't as busy as Highway 43 is now. Oh, wow. So um, everything's here. Everything's there. So yeah. what tourist spots would you recommend to people? Because as I've said, if you come on the show, I will come to your community and I will spend my economic dollars in your community. So yeah. as a tourist coming to your community later this year, what yeah. are some of those hot spots that I should be visiting? Well, as a tourist coming to my community later this year, you best go to the website and get my cell phone number and pop me a text because you tell me when you're here, I will meet you and I will show you some of the wonderful things that there are to see in this community. You cannot come to the town of Marathorpe without stopping and seeing the Fallen Fort Park. Um, and uh, For those who don't I, know, can you just explain that briefly? Sure. Um, oh boy. Oh, so long ago now. It's it's hard to even it's hard to even fathom how long ago. Um, not quite twenty years, but we're 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 approaching that 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 mark. Um, four young police officers were murdered on a farm just northeast of the town of Marthorpe. Uh, three of those officers were stationed here at our detachment in Marthorpe, and one of them was from Whiteport. In the aftermath of the tragedy, a group of people got together and fundraised and built a, a memorial. Now, the, the other interesting thing about that memorial is it's a, it's a big park. Um, and in, oh boy, two and a half years ago, I want to say, the Fallen Forest Society divested ownership of the park itself to the town of Mayerthorpe. So now the town of Mayerthorpe owns that piece of land and the building and all the things that are on it. Um, they moved all the memorabilia from inside the, the building that's there has been moved uh, to other places, mostly Depo in Regina has got the memorabilia from in there, but our public library now occupies the building that was formerly home to the fallen four memorabilia piece of things. Now the there's still four statues there, uh, bronze statues, at uh, I think 130% of life size. So they're larger than life, which is how we want to remember them. Uh, and then there's a um, the uh, monolith in the middle. The, um, so the, the, the park was, was um, commissioned after the tragedy and um, statues of constables, Peter Sheeman, Brock Myrell, um, Anthony Gordon, he was a fellow from Whiteport, and um, Leo Johnston all stand proudly in the park. So the Fallen Four Society still maintains the the monument itself, the statues and the and the monolith in the middle. They still maintain those, but the overall ownership and maintenance of the rest of the property now falls under the purview of the town of Marathorpe. So you can't come to Marathorpe without stopping and seeing the Fallen Four. You can't. Um, what else would you recommend a tourist do while in Marathorpe? Um, you can't come to, they're disappearing all over the prairie, sad to say, but you can't come to the town of Marathorpe and not do a drive-by of our grain elevator. You have a grain which, elevator? We have a grain elevator, which was out of commission for a long time. It has been purchased by a private citizen and is now functioning as is now fulfilling its its intended function again oh, wow. yeah we have a grain elevator um which is pretty darn cool uh the other things let me think what else would i show you in my little town i'd have to take you to crockett house well, i i just I, I was just gonna say wasn't there a coffee shop that you just said that's right around the corner from you that i need to go it's, see it's literally right across the lake if i stood up right now and looked out my window i'd be looking at crockett house parking lot um, Crockett House, 
is aptly named because the Crockett's were one of the premier families in the town of Mayorthorpe. Uh, a number of years ago, they used to, it's still in town. We have a, a business called Crockett Automotive. It's <laughs> an automotive repair shop um, that's that continues to bear the name of, of uh, the Crockett's. But they were the, one of the premier families in Mayorthorpe. And uh, Crockett House, the Crockett House Cafe is the original family farm home that still sits in its exact same location. The town wow. was built around it. Um, so it's the uh, two and a half story um, Victorian type farmhouse with a veranda and the whole nine yards um, that was purchased, oh boy, I want to say maybe five years or so ago by uh, private citizens. It's always been privately owned, but it was purchased and um, their, uh, their desire was to turn it into a bistro. Now, I was sitting on council when all of that came to pass and when I heard that I went, Oh no, they're gonna wreck Crockett House. Because as a realtor, I listed and sold Crockett House twice. So I have a real soft spot in my heart for the for the place. And um the the folks that bought it have done an absolutely amazing job. Sure things had to change. One of the bedrooms upstairs had to be converted because they use upstairs uh, for meeting rooms and they needed an egress point from the upstairs in case of a fight. So they had to convert a bedroom into kind of a locker room with access to the, the to the stairway. Um, but the original staircase is still there. The original pocket doors are still there. The original hardwood flooring is still in the building. And they have some of the best soup and sandwiches you're ever going to taste. If you come um, their soups are all homemade. If you come on a Wednesday, um, get yourself a cinnamon bun about that big. And if you're a coffee drinker, they employ people that they train to be true baristas. They don't make coffee in bulk. They make it a cup at a time and grind oh. the beans fresh every time. Am I singing to you, Chris? <laughs> you are singing my love language, Janet. There you I go. So, yeah, I would definitely take you to see Crockett House and take you on a little tour of Crockett House. Um, oh, I want to end on one last question here, if possible, sure. because sure. we're at the 45 minute mark and I want to make sure I get this question in. Sure. And this is the most important question and you can take as long as you want to answer this and then we will wrap up. In your opinion, Janet, what makes the town of Marathorpe such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Um, Mayor Thorpe is the quintessential small Alberta town. Um, again, we probably have more amenities here than we have a right to, if you want to call it that. Mayor Thorpe is a is a quiet little community where you don't go to the co-op just to grocery shop. It's a social occasion. I ne I I never can do. My husband doesn't even want to come to the co-op with me anymore because it's never five minutes in the door and out again. It's always, there's at, always at least two or three people that want to have a conversation and they may want to talk about something, you know, government related, but nine times out of 10, they just want to stop and say, Hey, how the heck are you? I haven't seen you for a long time. Um, the pace of life in my town is more sedate than certainly than Edmonton, than Whiteport, which is just up the road. Whiteport's pretty urban now. I lived there for a while a number of years ago, but um, Whiteport's pretty urban now. So the, the, the pace of life in my town is is quite sedate. Not every road in Marathorpe is paved. Our main, our more main thoroughfares are paved, but most of the roads in my town are gravel. And I told somebody a while ago, they were, I was you know, cheerleading my town, which again, my mandate, my job, um, cheerleading my town. And they said, well, what is it that you like so much about Marathorpe? And I, I looked them square in the eye and I said, you're not going to believe me when I tell you this. You're going to think I'm nuts. And they're going, okay, what? I said, the thing I love most about my town, besides my grandchildren, are the shameless, gravel roads. Shameless plug for the uh, grandma in the house. For the grand <laughs> exactly. The thing I love most are the gravel roads. And yeah, I was right. I got looked at like I got three heads. And, you know, why on earth do you like gravel roads? 
because it means people slow down a little bit. They're not ripping up and down at 60 kilometers an hour and not paying attention to the house. If you're driving slower, you got to pay attention to, to Nadine across the street. You got to pay attention to her flowers. You got to pay attention to her bird feeder or um, you got to, down the road a little bit further down the road if you're driving slower you're going to stop and you're going to notice that rob and joanne have a different flag hanging off the front of their house than they had last week or um the neighbor down the street has has um purple and pink petunias this year instead of the red and white ones she had last year or or somebody's putting sod down on there you're going to notice all of those things because you're moving at a slower pace so the same reason um, Teddy Roosevelt wouldn't let them straighten out the roads in the Black Hills in South Dakota. Make people drive slower. They're going to notice more and appreciate more. That is the most poignant thing I've ever heard on this show. Thank you so much for this, <laughs> Janet. Oh my I gosh, have, you're so welcome. This has been the best 50 minutes of my life that uh, I, I couldn't imagine having someone like you just lift my spirits up because you sound so personable and sound so uh, passionate about your community and the council table is uh, better served with you at the head. So thank you so much for taking time in your day to do this. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate, I appreciate those kind words. Thank you. So with that, I want to remind everyone, this has been the cross border interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day and remember everyone just keep talking.